Dr. Andy Thompson. Thank you, David. Thank you. How many of you here, at some point in your life, were religious believers? Of course, most of us are. Why did my mind, why did your mind, why did our minds generate religious ideas, religious beliefs, and accept them? Why? And what I hope to show you this morning is the answer to those questions. We're getting tantalizingly close to a comprehensive cognitive neuroscience of religious belief, robust theories, empirical evidence. And my plan this morning is to lay out for you uh, some of the basics for this, and then to uh, give you some of the empirical evidence, and to end on a historical note that I think both illuminates the past and the present and may tell us something about the future. The way to think about my talk is that I hope to give you, in a sense, like a Swiss Army knife. A Swiss Army knife of tools that you can take back to your community in the debates that you have uh, with believers. Before I do that, however, I need to thank uh, a number of people. Uh, Dave for the kind introduction, Ed Buckner and American Atheist for the invitation to be here uh, today, uh, to Arlene Marie for some help with logistics, uh, for Tim Dix with all his help with the AV that you'll see today. I also want to thank this man behind the camera here, Josh Timonen, built absolutely and maintains one of the best educational websites in the world, richarddawkins.net. Uh, behind him, his partner Maureen Norton, Josh and Maureen have contributed to the material you will hear today. And I particularly want to thank Richard Dawkins for the opportunity to work with his foundation, but more specifically, his work. I think, and I think this audience appreciates, that when Richard, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Dan Dennett, Ian Hersey Lee, when they publish these books, they are not only creating a sea change in the culture, but they're putting their lives on the line. People here know that there are others out there who don't share these ideas, who are threatened by them. And they really put their lives on the line for all of us. I think we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. <laughs> Where do we start? We start with Darwin. Darwin's remarkable idea not only gives us the only workable explanation we have for the design and variety of all life on Earth. His idea gives us the only workable explanation we have for the design and architecture of the human mind. And in that architecture, the pieces that generate religious belief. Basically, you take Darwin's idea, combine it with Watson and Crick, with genetics, and you have this. This is the modern Darwinian synthesis. Every organism is an integrated collection of problem-solving devices designed over evolutionary time by natural selection to promote in some specific way the genes that produce that adaption. Let's look at us. Look at me, okay? The heart solves the problem of pumping blood. Hemoglobin solves the problem of transporting oxygen. The lung solves the problem of extracting oxygen from the air. At every single level of biological inquiry, from membranes to mind, Darwinian natural selection. Now this statement also, I want you to look at carefully, is also a statement about the human mind. The mind is what the brain does, and the brain evolved under the same rules of natural selection. The brain is a collection, an integrated collection of problem-solving devices designed over evolutionary time by natural selection to promote in some specific way the genes that built that adaption. Steven Pinker has the analogy that the human mind is like the Apollo spacecraft, this compact collection of engineering devices solving a constant stream of problems, only a few of them conscious to the astronauts. You're sitting there now. I'm on your retina, upside down in two dimensions. Specific adaptions are turning that into a three-dimensional 
image. You don't know it, and I'll show you. You're watching my face, my eyes. You have very complex social cognitive uh, adaptations, some of which I'll show you contribute to religious belief. Now, the other fundamental is this, that we are, and we now know, risen apes, not fallen angels. <laughs> we arose in Africa, put aside our ethnic, religious, racial differences. Underneath our skins, we are all Africans. We are all, every one of the six billion people on this planet. We are all sons and daughters of a small band of hunter-gatherers that arose in Africa about 70,000 years ago and conquered the world. We're the last surviving hominid. You may not know it, this is your family history. Over here, the common down here, the common ancestor with chimps and bonobos. And then this is the hominid line. Australopithecines, Lucy, Panthropus, and then here we are, Homo, our genus Homo. Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalus, and then we're the last surviving hominid. This is Lucy up here, Homo erectus, about two million years ago, and us. And notice in particularly the area of the uh, frontal lobes. This shows it a little bit uh, clearer. On the left is the skull of a Homo erectus. On the right, Homo sapiens. Notice in particular the enlargement of the frontal lobe area. In, for evolution, a pretty quick period of time, we evolved these uh, frontal lobes. Why and why? If you remember, one and a half, two million years ago, Homo erectus left Africa without language, uh, went to Indonesia, the Caucasus, uh, really, in some sense, conquered half the world. They had conquered the physical environment by a million years ago. So what was left? What was the most challenging, complex part of our environment that drove the evolution of us? Well, the most challenging, complex part of the environment was probably each other. <laughs> and this is, the, this is the origin of our complex social cognitions. Why is this important? Because religious ideas, religious beliefs, are just the extraordinary use of everyday cognitions, everyday adaptations, social cognitions, agency detection, precautionary reasoning. That religious, belief, religious ideas, religious beliefs, are a byproduct of cognitive mechanisms designed originally for other purposes. Now, what's a byproduct? I notice a few people taking notes. Reading and writing is a cultural byproduct. We don't have reading and writing modules in our brain. It's a byproduct of fine motor skills, vision, uh, language. Music is a byproduct, a byproduct of, of language, hard vowels and consonants put to rhythm, originally the rhythm of a beating heart. And this is the essence of what religions are. Religions are byproducts of cognitive mechanisms, everyday cognitive mechanisms, uh, that created and arise really as an artifact of our ability to imagine uh, social worlds. They're always, always, every religious idea is a human concept with some uh, slight alteration. Now, how many of you here love Big Mac meals? Now, come on, I'm a psychiatrist. You can tell me, you know, it, it's confidential information, it's protected by HIPAA rules. You can tell me, how many of you love Big Macs? Come on. Of course, of course. How many of you, how many of you have cravings for broccoli? Cravings for broccoli. I mean, you can see there's variation in a species, but there's very few. All right, why? The, the reason for this is that if you understand the psychology of the Big Mac meal, you understand the psychology of religion. We have, I'm serious, I mean, let me show you this, okay? Um, we evolved adaptations for things that were crucial and rare. Sugars of ripe fruit, fat of lean game meat, of salt. Those were crucial adaptations in our past. 
And the modern world creates a novel form of it that comes from those adaptations, but hijacks them with super normal stimuli. Okay, not ripe fruit, but a Coca-Cola. Not lean game meat, uh, but you know a fat hamburger. French fries soaked in in meat juice, and it creates these super normal stimuli, but they're based on ancient adaptations. Let me just take you now on a little bit of a tour of some of these cognitive mechanisms. The first is decoupled cognition. Now, this is a fancy word for we can decouple our cognition in time. Since I have been talking, I will guarantee you that everybody in this room has thought of, while you're listening to me and paying close attention, you have thought of a conversation you have had with somebody in the past, or you are thinking about a conversation you're going to have with somebody、uh, later on today. As I'm talking right now, every one of us in this room can imagine and conduct in our heads a conversation with President Obama. Okay, it is as you can see, it's extraordinary and it's crucial for memory, for planning. Absolutely, one of the essences of our humanity. It allows us these complex interactions with unseen others, complex social interactions with unseen others. You can see that it's just one little step to, you know, communicating with a dead ancestor. I don't know about you, but I'm getting to the age where a lot of those near and dear to me have died, and I catch myself still talking to them. It's one step further to communicating to a god or gods. Hyperactive agency detection. All of us will mistake a shadow for a burglar. We will never mistake a burglar for a shadow. We have these hyperactive agency detection mechanisms. If we were to hear a loud bang right now, we would all startle, and we would assume it was not an accident. It was agency, and probably human agency. Now, you may reasonably ask, well, okay, how does decoupled cognition interacting with another? How does Hyperactive agency. How does that lead to supernatural figures, though? I mean, to you know, supernatural burglars. Okay, how do you get the the next level up from human to supernatural? This. Your minds fill in. There's no there are no lines there, but your minds see that square and fill in the lines. It's called intuitive reasoning, and it underlines the essence of religious ideas. Which are minimally counterintuitive worlds, MCIs. Now, what is what is this? It's an optimal compromise between the interesting and the expected, and it gives us attention-arresting and memorable things. Let me illustrate. If I tell you that that big tree out in front of the conference center. Will do your taxes, wash your laundry,、um, uh, you know, reprogram your computer.、Uh, you're simply not going to believe me. But if I tell you that tree, on the night of a full moon, will hear your wishes and grant them, you might be vulnerable to believing that. Not this audience, but many people. <laughs> but you might you might be vulnerable to it. Because there's just one slight twist, but everything you know about trees is intuitively in there, and you fill in the blanks. Now, think of think of the the, the Judeo-Christian God. Okay, he's everywhere. There's a little twist of physics, but it's just a guy, and you fill in the blanks. You don't even think about it, but you fill in the blanks. There, there's no violation of basic human assumptions. He's a guy. He can understand my southern accented English.、Um, you know, all the all the assumptions about humanness are filled in. There's just one little twist, and all religious ideas have these supernatural templates. They have a counterintuitive physical property, like you know, God is everywhere. A counterintuitive、uh, may have a counterintuitive piece of biology, the virgin birth, but Mary is otherwise just a girl. Uh, counterintuitive psychology, you know, God knows what I'm thinking, but if He knows what I'm thinking, why do I still have to pray to Him? Why do I still have to talk to Him? 
Because again, those basic assumptions about humanness are all still intact. That's why we believe it, that's why we'll, we'll start to accept it, and that's why it sticks in our heads. There's always, always the attribution of mental states, human mental states. Look at any religious idea. You know, go back to your college uh, courses, think about any religious system, any religious ideas you know of, and they fit this model. Now, we see this most clearly, some of these vulnerabilities in children. And, I mean, we're all children grown up. Children from very early on are common sense dualists. What does this mean? It means you can take a five-month-old and you can have a box, you can ar arrange for a box to move, jump, start like a person, and a five-month-old will startle, you know? A five-month-old doesn't startle when a human being moves in exactly the same way. So very early on, you start to see that we have systems that are designed for dealing with agents with intentions and goals and physical objects. You now, children know more than they learn. We come into the world with these systems already in place. It is natural from very early on to think of disembodied minds. Now, you can flip it around and you can understand why this is crucial. If I required a body to think about that person's mind, that's a real liability. It, it, it's, it's burdensome. I need to be able to think about somebody and think about what's going on in them and what their intentions or goals might be without them present. Jesse Baring in, in Ireland did some fascinating experiments. A puppet show in which an alligator eats a mouse. And then the children are asked, well, does the mouse still need to eat or drink? And the children say no. Is the, the mouse still moving around? No. Does the mouse think certain things? Does the mouse want certain things? The children say yes. You start to see that division. Half of four-year-olds, if you interview them, have imaginary friends. So that we see that the belief in some life separate from what is actually experienced in the body is the default setting of the human mind. Another thing about children is that they are causal determinants. What does this mean? Well, any mind that is oriented towards seeing intentions and desires and goals is going to overread purpose. If you ask a child, what are birds for? You know, to, to sing. What are rivers for? For boats to float on. What are rocks for? And for animals to scratch themselves. Okay? We, we overread causality, way overread causality and purpose. If you go to the Dawkins website, there's a fascinating interview between Richard Dawkins and Randy Nessie. And at the beginning of the uh, interview, it's fascinating. They both catch themselves talking about natural selection as an intentional agent. I mean, they realize they're using intentional language and they stop themselves. And so it's very easy for us to imagine, again, intentional agents that are separate from ourselves. Children will spontaneously invent the concept of God. What you start to see are these mechanisms that we're born with make us all very vulnerable to religious ideas. Religious ideas are much easier. It's disbelief, it's truly understanding, say, something like natural selection, that is cognitively a little bit harder. Decoupled cognition, hyperactive agency, minimally in intuitive worlds, promiscuous teleology, starting to build this, this list of cognitive mechanisms. Now we'll turn to the attachment mechanism. The attachment mechanism in humans was laid out by psychiatrist John Bowlby in England and Mary Ainsworth, the psychologist here. And the attachment system is the fundamental caretaking system in mammals. <coughs> And think about religions. You're in distress. What do you do? You turn to a caretaker. You turn to an attachment figure. Alan Walker, the great paleoanthropologist, has this absolutely haunting story in his book about the Turkana boy. And they found this 1.7 million year old 
uh, fossil of an adult woman, an adult Homo erectus woman, 1.7 million years old, and she had died of severe vitamin A poisoning, which would have meant that she was hemorrhaging into her joints, pain, couldn't move. It's a terrible way to die. But on closer inspection, they noticed that there was new bone growth, and it immediately caught them. They suddenly realized that this woman, 1.7 million years ago, had lived for months, and that it meant that somebody was taking care of her, bringing her food and water, you know, protecting her from predators, you know, sitting with her through the long, dark, dangerous nights in the savannas. So you see this attachment system you know, in our species, or in our ancestors, 1.7 million years ago. The attachment system is both crucial to belief, but what I want to show you is the attachment system is one of the things that makes it very hard to give up belief. And we see this illustrated in Darwin's life. If you remember, Darwin went on the voyage of the Beagle, 1831 to 1836. He comes home, and his, eye, his ideas are starting to gel. Uh, John Gould tells him his finches are you know, species that have never been seen before. And he realizes that species are not immutable. He starts to think about uh, evolution. Opens his notebooks. This was his original uh, tree of life. And sees that man may arise from animals, and there is no need for any deity. Remember, he went on the voyage of the Beagle as a creationist. This is what he writes in his notebook in 1837. Okay. He's engaged to Emma Wedgwood his first cousin. He realizes his species change. They evolve, but he doesn't have a mechanism. And in September of 1838, he reads Malthus's essay and he gets his idea. He sees the mechanism, the struggle for existence. At September 1838, somewhere in that fall, he told his fiancée. In November, he gets the first of these kind of letters. She was distressed. And she said, this kind of thinking might cause a painful void between us. They're married in January of 1839. In February of 1839, she writes him another letter. After his death, this letter was discovered, and on the bottom in his own hand is written, you don't know how many times I have cried over this. By the 1840s, Darwin is walking Emma and the children to the church on Sunday mornings, stopping at the gate, they go into church, he uh, goes off on a walk. And it is reasonable to think that it is the, the concern about his wife's reaction, the potential rupture of that bond, that's one of the things that led da Darwin to sit on his idea for uh, 20 years. And we see this fear of loss of attachment even in one of the modern apologists. Um, uh, Carl Giberson, uh, the Nazarene college physicist who is constantly talking about reconciling evolution and, uh, and, and uh, religion. And he states it quite explicitly. If he were to give up his faith, he would lose his parents, his wife, his children. Fear of loss of attachment, the rupture of that bond. So we see that the attachment system is both crucial to religion, it's one of the barriers to giving it up. Now I want to turn to theory of mind. All of you here know that I have a mind like your mind with intentions, wishes, and desires, but intentions, wishes, and desires that may be different from yours, that you have to uh, read. These capacities come online, oh, I think when we're about three or four years of age. Now, I want you to look at the picture on the left of Bogart and then quickly look over on the picture on the right. If you do that, the picture on the left, Bogart's eyes are looking to his left. When you look at the other picture, Bogart's eyes are looking to the right. But how can that be? It's the exact same picture, it's just flipped into a negative. Why do Bogart's eyes switch? And what I'm trying to tease out here is to show you that you have an, a separate dedicated system. When you look at faces, you have a separate de dedicated system that monitors eye gaze. Take a look at this for a moment and, and make a guess. Use your gut. Make a guess as to what this individual is feeling. Okay. What? Anybody want to guess? Uneasy. uneasy. That's right. Uneasy. Okay. What about this one? Irritated. 
playful. It's, play, it's uh, playful. Now, think about it for a moment. You're looking at grainy black and white photos of eyes, and you are making sophisticated discriminations about complex emotional states. Okay? The women are a little bit better at it than the men, but we can discern 212 complicated emotional states just from eye gaze. If you're interested in this, this is uh, Sasha Baron Cohen's smarter brother, uh, Simon Baron Cohen, at Cambridge. Um, this is much better than Borat. But look at it, and it, it's fascinating stuff. And that, uh, again, this is part of, of theory of mind. Um, you probably can't read the caption here. Let me read it for you. It says, what do you think I think about what you think I think you've been thinking about? Okay. And this is another part of theory of mind. Uh, called intentionality uh, with an S. And uh, it goes, the first order is I think, second order, I think you think, third order, I think you think, that I think, uh, fourth order, and we can go to about five, sometimes six orders, and that's about it. And you can see, I hope, where this is absolutely crucial to social interaction. Utterly crucial. And an, again, an extraordinary piece of cognitive software. Just extraordinary. Can everybody read the captions in there? Okay, uh, first one says, I think he's very boring. The stranger says, I believe that she thinks I'm very attractive. And the husband says, I suspect that he believes that she wants to run off with him. <laughs> but uh, you can see, now, look at what religions do. Religions, again, utilize this. I believe, I believe that God wants. I believe that God wants us to act with righteous intent. Fourth order is social religion. I want you to believe that God wants us to act with righteous intent. Uh, fifth order, communal religion. I want you to know that we both believe that God wants us to act with righteous intent. You see how religions utilize this cognitive adaption, which is just an ordinary, not so ordinary really, but cognitive adaption that's crucial to our social interaction. Now, let me turn to one of the, I think, most exciting things that's come along in a long time. Just came out this past uh, March, and it is a paper by a group of people, a senior author is uh, Kapogiannis. This research comes from the National Institute of Health, National Institute of Stroke and Cerebral Vascular Disease, which I just love. And what they did is that, this is a unique study, they took 20 men, 20 women, various religions, and they put them in functional MRI machines, and they read about 100 different paired statements um, about uh, religious experience, knowledge, various things. Uh, God uh, controls the world. God is absent from the world. God has views on marriage. God uh, disapproves of homosexuality. God has ideas about marriage. I mean, there's just this long list, and they put these individuals in functional MRIs and, measure, and asked them whether they agreed or disagreed with the statement, and then measured their response. If you're not used to seeing MRIs, uh, if you start over here on the left, that's like my right hemisphere has been removed, and, and you're looking at sort of a split brain, you're looking into my uh, brain, uh, the, right in the midline, and then as we go down to the right, the rest, my right front, my right, uh, right hemisphere is filling in. So midline on the left and at the, at the end on the right is the outer cortex. And uh, the patterns that arose were uh, uh, uniform. Uh, God's love, God's anger, uh, doctrinal religious knowledge, and then experiential religious knowledge. And, and, and all these individuals, the patterns came out the same. Well, why? Okay. There were three dimensions of religious belief that, that teased out. God's perceived level of involvement, God's perceived emotions, and doctrinal knowledge and experiential knowledge. All of this, all of this was localized in networks that processed theory of mind, theory of mind capacities, and abstract semantics and imagery. Why this is important is that it's unique. We know we've had MRI studies of Buddhist monks and some outliers, but these are just ordinary people 
of various religious persuasions. And what it shows is that the components of religious belief are served by well-known neural circuits, circuits that we already know about, which mediate these evolutionary adaptive cognitive mechanisms. That religion is integrated into the brain using networks for social cognition. They're not specific relig religious networks in the brain or specific religious networks in various individuals. They, they, they come down on well-known circuits used in social cognition. And this is, I think, powerful, powerful evidence supporting the idea that religions arise from these ordinary evolved cognitive mechanisms used in social interaction. And you've got to just love that this comes from the National Institute of Health. <laughs> now, problem of dead bodies. What do we do with dead bodies? Okay. Is he dead or is he sleeping? Okay. Okay. And what happens when we are confronted with a dead body is that, particularly of someone we love, we've got a problem because there's a conflict. There's a conflict between those theory of mind capacities that we have because those theory of mind capacities keep on going and the part of us, the natural kinds modules that tell us this body is quite dead. So the mind is alive, the body's dead, we have a conflict. This is why when you lose somebody that you love, you just keep on talking to them. This is part, I mean it's very hard because of our theory of mind modules, it's very hard for us to conceive of our own deaths. This, this is why we plan our funerals, there's part of us that think we're still going to be there. Okay. And I had a patient a couple weeks ago, his best friend committed suicide. For weeks after, he's text messaging, he's still text messaging his best friend. Okay. And you can see that this conflict of theory of mind and natural kind models, modules, the problem of dead bodies, really dovetails with decoupled cognition, these other things I've shown you, and creates the, the release and the idea of souls and the, and the continued life afterwards. Which again is not, as I hope I've shown you, is not that much of a stretch based on our evolved cognitive architecture. What do you, just do a gut check. What do you feel when you see this man? I feel kindly older brother. And this is a concept that uh, was discovered by Freud. Uh, the concept of transference, that we base current relationships on past relationships. Okay? We set a grammar of relatedness very early in our lives. How many of you have seen the movie Memento? Okay. It shows what happens when you lose that capacity. You have to learn about social relationships each new time. You can see how religions hijack these capacities for transference, you know, and, and particularly parental transferences. So you start, I hope, to see how we hijack parental transferences and it, it also cues into the attachment system. Some other cognitive mechanisms, childhood credulity. As Richard has said, natural selection designed child brains to soak up the culture around them. And a child can't tell the difference between good advice, don't swim in the river with alligators, and bad advice, sacrifice a pig for the new harvest. All of us are much, much more deferential to authority than any of us would like to believe. The famous Stanley Milgram experiments that showed that we will do things under the guide of an authority that we, at another level, know we shouldn't. Reciprocal altruism. All of us keep in our heads who we owe and what we owe. And who owes us. And you can see religions utilize this. You know, if you sacrifice, you'll receive something in return. Reciprocity. This. Romantic love. We have circuits in our brain designed for romantic love, for intense focus and love and commitment to an individual. And this cognitive mechanism is also used in uh, religions. Think about Mother Teresa's recent letters where she talked about uh, Mary and Christ. If you've seen the movie The Painted Veil, uh, the Diane Rigg character, the nun, has this powerful soliloquy in which she talks about it as a young girl she fell in love with Jesus. Uh, moral feeling systems. All of us have inferential moral systems that come online as early as age one. But it's very hard for us to be conscious of uh, the origins of this. We just sort of know it instinctively at a gut level. It's very hard to be conscious of it, and this is what religions hijack. 
and then they claim we wouldn't have morality if it weren't for them. And they, they recruit these moral systems, obviously, to lend credence and plausibility to gods, particularly use these moral systems uh, to link commitment mechanisms and you know, to provide a competent, morally competent witness. And it, it helps us become conscious of our moral systems, which are still you know, basically instinctive. I think this is a useful way to think about the difference between morality and religious morality. Morality is doing what is right, regardless of what we're told. Religious dogma is doing what we're told, regardless of uh, whether it was right. Something that is related to this is altruistic punishment. This, again, is a cognitive mechanism all of us have. We are willing to punish social cheats at a cost to ourselves. All of us do it. All of us have done it. Again, crucial to social life. Suicide terrorism is just one step removed. Empathy. Now, if I raise my right hand, there are neurons in my left motor strip that are lighting up. As you all are sitting there watching me raise my right hand, the same neurons in your left motor strip light up. Exact same ones, but you inhibit the response. If I take my hand and I take this knife and I start to poke it in, I'm feeling a little pain right now, okay, and some neurons are lighting up in my left sensory motor strip, my thalamus, and I'm starting, I'm starting to feel pain. Okay, as you are watching me do this, the same neurons in your left sensory motor strip are also lighting up. As I'm doing this, all you got to do is see me doing this, and maybe a little wince on my face, and you feel the same thing. You literally feel my pain. This capacity for empathy, again, crucial for social relationships. How do religions hijack this? Um, this is a Filipino devotee who last year had himself nailed to a cross. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a child, I saw a lot of this, and it really distressed me. And I, and I felt, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. I'm kind of, but I can remember being distressed by this. And every time that this kind of thing is displayed, no matter how hardened you get to it, at some level, those, those, those parts of you that feel the kind of pain that would be induced by this torture will light up. And, you, and you know, religions hijack this uh, capacity for literally feeling others' pain to induce guilt and obligation. Another thing that we use are hard-to-fake, honest signals of commitment. How do you know I'm really committed? You know, why would you believe what I say? I need to give you a hard-to-fake, honest signal of commitment. Again, crucial to social relationships. You can see how religions utilize this, all religions. You know, suicide terrorism is another hard-to-fake, honest signal of commitment. It's connected with religious rituals, and religious rituals tap into another mechanism, our threat response system. They're compelling, rigidly scripted, usually have to do with uh, cleansing and order. And they enable rituals. Again, I hope you start to see how all of these mechanisms sort of come together. We experience them like consciousness as a seamless whole, but they're really uh, very specific uh, parts. And religious rituals enable us to both demonstrate and have scrutinized our hard-to-fake honest signals. They communicate intentions. It's another way of communicating goals and intentions. Inculcate doctrines, forge alliances, create hope, solace, entertain. They are divorced from the original goal of, of protection. Uh, they delimit uh, sacred spaces. Um, and they exploit another thing that we're biased towards, which is the gestalt law of the whole. Basically, what this means is when you see a flying V formation of birds, you don't see the individuals, you just see the formation, the V, okay? the gestalt law of the whole. Religions exploit this, creating these attention-arresting, memorable, and often intimidating uh, spectacles designed again, to engage us and, and make us tremble. Other, other mechanisms, 
that are involved. Uh, motivated reasoning, we doubt what we don't like. Uh, confirmation bias, uh, we notice data that fits our beliefs. Uh, mere familiarity. Uh, and uh, kin psychology, and, and this is huge in religion. And all of us have mechanisms to identify and favor kin. And, you know, religions uh, hijack uh, this. Just look at the Catholic Church, you know, the, the priests are brothers, the nuns are sisters, the Pope is the Holy Father. So, I hope I have shown you, and, and this is just, a, a, you know, a modest list. This is not the complete list of the things that we have teased out, the cognitive mechanisms designed for other purposes that come together to create religious beliefs, religious ideas, and make us vulnerable to uh, believing them and passing them on. So I'd like to end now on a little historical note that I think uh, is interesting and may show the light to the future. In 1918, 80 years after Darwin had figured out his idea of natural selection, William Jennings Bryan began what Dudley Malone called his duel to the death with evolution. And it culminated in the John Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee in the summer of 1925. Only um, evolution survived, uh, Brian did not. Clarence Darrow put on one of the most spectacular cross-exams of a hostile witness ever and utterly uh, devastated Brian. It took him apart on this witness stand. William Jennings Bryan died five days after the trial. Things remained quiet for about 40 years. And then in the 1960s, uh, we begin a sequence of court cases, starting uh, the, the ones in yellow are the Supreme Court cases. And uh, starting uh, with the Epperson case, which banned any bans on teaching evolution, and then there was the pushback from the religious, uh, the religious, the attempts to get creation taught, creation science. Uh, there have been 17 cases in major cases, and the most recent being the Dover case. And in each case, uh, science and evolution has won. At the Scopes trial, Dudley Malone, who was an Irish Catholic divorce lawyer and who was uh, Clarence Darrow's co-counsel, gave what is considered the best speech of the trial the academic freedom speech, uh, in which he said, teach science, teach evolution. But he said there was no conflict between religion and science. And if you remember the Dover case, uh, Kenneth Miller, the brown biologist, was one of the chief plaintiff's experts, and he said intelligent design you know, was not science, but there was no conflict between religion and science. And that made it into Judge Jones's uh, decision. I think this audience knows that there is indeed a conflict between science and religion. And if I have done my job this morning, and if I've done my job well, I hope I have shown you that we are on the threshold of a comprehensive cognitive neuroscience of religion. Okay. And it deepens the conflict between uh, science and religion. Okay. Not just the science of evolutionary biology, which Darwin started, but the science of the mind, the evolutionary cognitive neuroscience, which Darwin also started. And it deepens that conflict. And it is not long before any psychology textbook, for a psychology textbook to be current and up to date, it will have to include this cognitive neuroscience of religion. And it's not going to be long before a John Scopes or a Jane Scopes moves to teach cognitive neuroscience of religion in a high school class, in a public school. And you and I know that there will then be litigation. The litigation uh, will be brought by the religious right. And I think, I hope, given what I've shown you this morning, that your feeling 
about that litigation is the same as mine, which is bring it on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.